our sermon text this morning as we continue through the Gospel of Mark together is chapter number 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 20. Mark's Gospel 4, 1 through 20, here's what Jesus says to us this morning. And he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea and the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it scorched, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. For those, but for those outside, everything is in parables. Why? So that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may may indeed hear, but not understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But... Those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And all of God's people say, Amen. There's a sermon notes page in the bulletin this morning, and uh, there's also a little kids' notes that you should have seen. If you have kids, want them to take some notes. Answer a few questions about the sermon this morning. That was also on the way in. If you didn't grab that, they're on that little table in the back. You can feel free to go grab one of those. Um, and notice the outline there. It's a little, uh, little more, uh, uh, it's not a normal outline. It just helps you to visualize what the Lord is saying here. Because in the parable, he says, uh, he speaks of three different uh, things. And then he's going to explain those three different things. Uh, so notice, just notice that. Help you to sort of uh, keep score this morning. Well, uh, Mark 4, 1 through 20, the parable of the sower, uh, the essence of it is this, to use a uh, very f- uh, familiar, uh, I think it's like a bumper sticker or it's a slogan. I've seen it on t-shirts, I've seen it on flags, I've seen it everywhere. Uh, you, you probably have too. Uh, the, the essence of Mark 4 is this, keep calm and kingdom on. Keep calm and kingdom on. We are the citizens of Jesus Christ's eternal and heavenly kingdom. He's our king. And so keep calm. Keep calm. And kingdom on, as it were. There's no need for us to fret, loved ones. There's no need for us to be afraid of what uh, awaits us in the world. There's no need to be afraid of what is going to happen November, whatever the date is, the 3rd or the 4th, or wherever they decide the election is won. Uh, If you're a Republican this morning, uh, whenever that uh, outcome happens, uh, if the Democrats win, Keep calm. If you're a Democrat this morning and uh, the Republicans win, it's the same message to us. Keep calm. And if you're libertarian, well, you know, there'll be plenty of things to complain about after the election no matter what. So um, keep calm. Okay, same message to you too. Keep calm. 
uh, and all the other small parties uh, the same, okay, the same. And if you have no party, you don't care, keep calm. We are Christians, first and foremost. We are citizens of an everlasting kingdom. There's no need for us uh, to, 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 to get caught up in uh, the winds of turmoil and change and chaos. And they all want to whip us up into a frenzy, uh, get excited, uh, vote, and uh, do what we got to do. Keep calm. You belong to a kingdom that has no end. Didn't we just say that somewhere? Didn't, he, didn't, didn't we just say that? Whose kingdom has no end? Do you believe that? Whose kingdom has no end, right? If the Republican Party ends, the kingdom of God endures. If the Democratic Party ends, the kingdom of God endures. And, and uh, in all in between, the kingdom of God endures. Uh, why? Because our king is alive. Our king is the one who endures forever, and he will take us to himself one day. Now, here in Mark's Gospel 4, then, as we want to keep calm and be citizens of the kingdom of God, of course, it's very difficult as members and citizens of a, a, a temporal kingdom or a nation like ours. It's always difficult, the tension between the two, but we are citizens of heaven, of a heavenly kingdom. Notice here in chapter 4, this is the first of three uh, kingdom parables. You'll see that if you just keep reading down in chapter 4. Uh, the next couple of little paragraphs there. Jesus speaks his kingdom parables. Mark's gospel is shorter than the gospel of Matthew and Luke. Uh, these are called the synoptics. They see this sort of the same things from the same vantage point, as it were. Um, there are just three, though, in this uh, section. Matthew 13 has many more. But here are just three short parables for us. This is the lengthiest of them. Uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, the parable of the sower. Uh, parables are meant to illustrate, to be illustrative, to be imaginative ways of explaining truth. But there's a little caveat to that, and I'll come to that in just a moment. So yes, they are illustrations. Yes, they are imaginative. Uh, yes, they illustrate truth. Yes, they explain the truth of the kingdom, uh, which is a kingdom that has no end again. We've prayed this morning, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. But yet Jesus has already told us in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 15, uh, 14 and 15, repent, believe. Why? The kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. It's amongst you. So on the one hand, the kingdom is here. On the other hand, it's not yet here. Uh, it is here because the gospel is here, but it's not yet in its fullness here. And so when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying that that eternal and perfect rule and reign of Almighty God our heavenly king, that that rule and reign would come from heaven down to this earth and make its impact in this age, but especially, ultimately, finally, completely in that age that is to come. The kingdom is heaven. The kingdom is God's reign. The kingdom is God's own presence. We read about it in Revelation 21, that city that's comes down out of heaven from God himself, and it makes its dwelling place amongst this world that ultimately we will live in and dwell in to the glory of God. And so here is a, the first of three kingdom parables, these illustrative uh, descriptions using imagination uh, to teach the truth of the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God that exists perfectly in heaven that is trickling down and making its way in the world through us, his citizens, but ultimately will come one day in its fullness. And so Jesus wants to encourage us. He wants to encourage us that we are to stay calm in this age. And as the kingdom goes out and as the word of the kingdom is spread like seed, and that seed falls upon all kinds of different ground, and it, that is to say it comes at a very different people, and it looks to us like it's unproductive. It looks to us like it's not very powerful. It looks to us like it's not growing. It looks to us like the kingdom is not very successful outwardly. There are four different soils, four different kinds of hearers here. How many of them are productive? How many of them produce fruit, produce grain? Only one. That means three, right? If you're playing baseball, that's a 250 average. You'd probably be stuck in the minor leagues your whole life. One out of four, not very good. But notice the one produces 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. It doesn't look to us very productive and very successful, but it is. Stay calm, the Lord says. He's in charge. He's in 
control. And so notice there in verses 1 and 2, he's by the sea again, the Sea of Galilee. And again, there's a very large crowd that is gathered around Jesus. And again, Jesus is teaching them. Uh, and he has to get into a boat to go out from shore just a little bit because the crowds are so large, they're going to crush him and press in upon him. Uh, remember, their, their, chapter 3 said they're trying to touch and grab him because they desire to be healed. And so he floats out just a little bit into this little, this little boat, and he begins to teach them, and he does so. Notice verse 2 in parables. He does so in parables. So notice, first of all here, then, I want you to see the parable, and then I want you to see... Uh, the, uh, the purpose of the parable. The parable is described here in verses 3 through 9. Our Lord there around the sea, or at the sea, surrounded by a crowd, teaching, but this time he does so in parables. He does so in parables. He has been up to this point teaching as one with great authority. The scribes were in awe of his teaching. He does not just merely debate, well, this rabbi says this, and you know, Rabbi Shimei says this, or Hillel says that. And they debate amongst themselves and they don't really have resolution. No, he came with authority. Repent, believe, the kingdom is here. It's amongst you. I am that king. And I brought that kingdom. But now he begins to teach in a strange way. With parables. Notice there's a sower, he says, verse 3. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. A, 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 a farmer, a planter. A sower. He's going out and he has many seeds and he's uh, taking them from the bag that's probably attached to his side and he's spreading those seed along the ground that he's seeking to harvest. He's spreading seeds, notice, like a planter. We probably, uh, we don't, we don't necessarily really have the biggest of land here and we don't have big farms in our backyards, our front yards, but we have lawns or we have small little gardens and you know, we've tried to plant things. This, this summer was like the summer for me to beat back the crabgrass uh, at my house. And so if you've been to my house this summer, you saw lots of patches of dirt because I was ripping out crabgrass. If you come today, you'll see, finally, there's some grass growing. Okay, I've been planting seeds. Uh, and it's hard work, right? You have to continue to pluck out all the, the weeds that grow up next to the thorns here. Uh, birds every morning come and they pluck up. They try to get the worms, but they also try to get the seeds because they're nice and tasty. So you've got to cover them up and hide them with, with soil or sand. And you've got to keep it wet so that it grows. And you've got to hopefully uh, have some sun. So I planted them just at the right time because now we have clouds. And it's not going to be as hot and warm. The seeds won't germinate as well. But here is this sower, right? And we know what it's like to plant seeds and, or try to plant something. And he's throwing his seeds across the ground. And Jesus gives this illustration then that the seeds fall and there are all kinds of soil upon which these seeds from the sower are falling. Notice there are four of them, verses uh, 4 through 9. Four kinds of soil. So there's a sower, there are seeds, and there are soils. Notice that some of the seeds as he's throwing them, and he's, even as I was throwing seeds, uh, grass seeds upon my lawn to reseed them, some of them hit the sidewalk. You might try to sweep them up uh, back onto the grass or you know, squirt them back in with the hose, but they're not going to last very long. Uh, these are the ones, he says, that the birds come. The birds come and pluck them up and devour them. So some seed fall upon the wayside, right? The sidewalk, the pathway where people walk, because you would travel from one property to another, just like we do on sidewalks, but there, of course, it would have, would have been a dirt road. And if some of your seed didn't land on your nice cultivated land, it landed on your hard trodden path, the birds are gonna see them and devour them. There's other kind, there's other kind of ground the seeds fall as they're thrown out. They sometimes fall on a little bit more rocky grounds. Uh, we have here, we have uh, the hard clay, but we can imagine something of a rocky soil. If you might have a slope in your backyard with rocks on it and uh, hard, uh, it's, just a, it's a hard place to grow things. These seeds fall upon uh, that kind of soil, this rocky soil, but there's not much soil there. It's only a, a thin layer of soil upon the rocks or the bedrock or the limestone or the clay as we have it here in North County. Uh, and they fall there uh, and immediately they, they can spring up because there's a little bit of soil, just enough for them to spring up, but they're not deep enough. The roots don't grow deep enough. And so when it's a hot day, 
And even as my little seedlings began to pop up, and I would be excited in the morning because the dew came at night and they were popping up. If I forgot to water the grass by noon these last few weeks and months, those little seedlings started to wilt. They started to burn. They started to die. And he says the same thing here. Sometimes seeds fall upon the rocky soil and it doesn't have a very good depth. And it's the sun rises up. It's scorched, verse number six says. And because it has no root, it withers away. And then you're like Danny Hyde and you have to go to Lowe's and buy another bag of seeds because you've wasted a whole, a whole bag of seeds because you didn't water it and they all burned. And you've got to do it again. So finally, I learned my lesson. I finally have seeds growing. The third kind, notice. The third kind. There, uh, there are seeds that fall upon uh, ground that has thorns. We might just think of weeds. Okay? Thorns and thistles, right? Genesis 3. That's a curse. Thorns and thistles. And so you throw seeds out, this, this parable says, and they land there, but there's, uh, it's a patch of grass or a patch of your, your ground that has thorns, weeds, and they choke up, right? The dandelions grow up and they choke up the grass. The crabgrass comes. It looks like grass. It, 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 it hides itself like grass, but it's not grass. Or it is grass, but it's a bad kind of grass that you don't like. It eats up the good grass. It takes all the nutrients. And so the same thing. This, the seeds hit this soil that has thorns, and the thorns choke up the seeds. There's no grain that's yielded. And then fourth and finally, he says, there's the good soil. There's the wayside, there's the rocky, there's the thorny, but there is some good soil. And the seeds germinate, and they begin to grow, and they eventually sprout, and eventually there's a 30-fold, notice, 60-fold, 100-fold harvest. This is a massive amount. Massive amount. From a tiny little seed, this massive amount of grain and wheat and food can be produced. He who has ears, the Lord says. This little refrain, we'll notice this refrain in these parables. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why does he say that? It's interesting, isn't it? Why does Jesus say that? Of course, everybody has ears, don't we? Don't we all have ears here this morning? Are we not all hearing these words? Yes. But I've said it before, and I'll have to say it again, right? All of us who, uh, we all once were children, and now those of us with children as parents, we know that just because our kids have two ears, they don't always hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's not speaking here the fact that God made us as human beings with two ears ordinarily to hear, to hear sounds, to hear syllables, to hear the sound waves that hit, hit on our eardrum and reverberate to our brain and it translates it into meaningful discourse and understanding. No, he's not speaking of that kind of hearing. He was ears. If you really are hearing what I'm saying, the Lord speaking to you, my servants, Jesus speaking to his disciples, God speaking to us, he who has ears, do you hear his voice? Let him hear. So this interesting parable, isn't it? He then explains it for us in a lengthy little section there, verses 10 to the end, verse 20. Notice the purpose of it. And the, the thing that he says there, the first couple of verses there, verses 10 to 13, uh, in your outline it says, to reveal the kingdom. The purpose of this parable is to reveal the kingdom. Notice, the crowds are great. He's in a boat. He's, on, he's offshore. He's teaching the crowd. Massive crowd in a boat on this lake. But now, the tra it's, we transition in verse 10. When he was alone. So he's no longer outside, but he's inside. No longer with the great crowd. But now he's just, notice, with a few people around him as well as the twelve. His inner circle of twelve and a few other disciples who've attached themselves to the group who follow the Lord, who are disciples of Jesus. They ask him about the parables. Notice, he's just said, he who has ears, let him hear. And so they ask. And so he answers, verse 11. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, Interesting, there's a double entendre here because he's actually in a house. They are inside and there is a crowd outside. But he's not speaking again of geography here. 
No, he's speaking to those who have ears to hear and those who don't. Those who are in the kingdom and those who are outside the kingdom. Those who are inside the the castle walls of the kingdom, safe and secure, protected by Jesus. Those who are outside, who are enemies. To you it has been granted or has been given the secret of the kingdom of heaven. But for those outside, everything is in parables. Notice what he's saying there. That that means that the parable should be clear to the person who understands. The parables are clear discourse and teaching to the disciple. The parables are understandable by those who have ears to hear them. But for those who are outside, for those who are enemies, uh, for those who are skeptics and doubters, those who are agnostic about the kingdom and so forth, no, my teaching comes in parables. Now that, that challenges one, it corrects a misunderstanding that you and I might have about parables. We may have been taught, we may have heard, uh, we may have read somewhere, we may have even thought about up ourselves that parables, because they are illustrative and they are imaginative, and uh, because of that, they are meant to illustrate the truth in a very simple childlike way. I mean, here's Jesus using very common understanding of a common cultural thing that everybody, for the most part, had a farm and, or, uh, or, or had slaves who farmed their land for them. Everybody knew what a sower was and seed and throwing seed and the kinds of soils and so forth. And many of us have been taught, we've, we've heard, we've read, we've thought of it ourselves, that, that this means that parables are like teaching our kids. They're meant to illustrate in very simple ways the powerful truths of the gospel. But what does Jesus say? Is that what Jesus says here? Is it? He challenges our misunderstanding, I believe, of what parables are, notice. To those who are inside, it's been granted to know the secrets of the kingdom, but those who are outside, it's in parables. And notice what he does there. Notice what he does there. He Cites there for us from the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. Here's the reason why, for those who are outside the kingdom, my teaching is in parables. Here's why. That they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. God once spoke these words to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. If you have your Bible, you can turn there quickly. In Isaiah 6, you might know that chapter uh, because it's the great and glorious call of Isaiah as a prophet where he sees the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe fills the temple and he hears the seraphim crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shake. The whole house will smoke. He cries out, woe is me, I'm lost. The angel takes takes tongs tongs from uh, from the altar, a coal, and puts it upon his lips to cleanse his lips to go out and preach. And we oftentimes end our reading there. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt's taken away. Your sin is atoned for. We usually stop reading. That's the glorious, right? I mean... Uh, R.C. Sproul's great book on the holiness of God is this whole little section of this chapter, but the chapter goes on. Whom shall I send, the Lord is asking. Who will go for us? And Isaiah steps forth, here am I, send me. And so the Lord says, oh, great, I have a man who has heard my voice. He wants to be a pastor. He wants to preach my word. He wants to be a sower of the seed. Uh, He wants to go back to his people and to bring them the news of the Lord, the good news. And so the Lord says, great, I have a man. I have a a candidate for the ministry who wants to go out. And here's his call. Here's his charge. Here's what God says to him. Keep on hearing, but don't understand. This is what the Lord says to Isaiah to say to the Israelites. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. That's our little text that's quoted by Jesus. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest, and here again Jesus quotes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. 
Jesus spoke in parables to harden hearts. That might be hard for us to hear, but that's what he said. Jesus spoke in parables to confound the wisdom of the wise, the scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders, who thought that they were righteous in themselves. He spoke in parables, yes, in very simple ways, but they couldn't even understand the simplest of things. Why not, though? It's so simple, isn't it? How could they not understand the parable of sower, seeds, and soils? It's because it, Jesus' whole entire ministry here and his teaching in the prophet Isaiah and so forth, it all presupposes that every single one of these people who's hearing Jesus' voice, they're blinded by their sin. Jesus presupposes a doctrine of sin that every human being has a hard heart and the seed cannot penetrate. Every human being is blinded and cannot see their need of a Savior and to see that Jesus is that Savior. Every human being is born with ears that are deaf and just will not listen to God. Every one of us is born with a sin nature that, 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 that means that our wills serve ourselves. The prophet Jeremiah said the worst idol of all in Jeremiah 16 is not the idols of little trinkets and gods, but the will, the stubborn will. Everyone's blind. No one in themselves will get it. And that's why, notice, Jesus says, when he was alone, verse 10, those around him with the twelve asked about the parables, and he said to them, to you has been given. Notice that verb, given. To you has been given. It's been granted. It's been graced to you. It's been gifted to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. It's not that the twelve and these other the disciples like Mary and so forth it's not that they were more intuitive. It's not that they were smarter. It's not that they liked to listen and take notes and go study more. It's not that they had less sin. It's not that they were less blinded or less hardened in heart or less stopped up in their ears or their wills were just a little bit less bent in upon themselves. To you and to you alone. Not those outside. To you has been given. And it's interesting that in the, in the New Testament, this verb is typically, it, it means that it's been given by God. God is the assumed giver. It's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. So why did he speak in parables? To reveal the kingdom, but notice to reveal it by grace to those whom he chooses to give it. And to speak that way, to confound, in such a simple way, but to confound the wisdom of the wise to those to whom he has not given it. And then he explains, notice. Then he explains the meaning of it. Do you not understand this parable? Verse 13. How do you then understand all the parables? The Lord gives an explanation of it to his inner circle, those to whom he's granted to know the secret of the kingdom, that he's the king, the kingdom has come, and that we are its citizens. Notice he explains then, the sower is one who, uh, the sower of seed, notice he sows what? Verse 14, the word. The word, he sows the word. That means then the sower is what? A preacher, right? A preacher. In the Old Testament, a prophet. It's the Lord Jesus here, of course, as the great prophet par excellence. It's the apostles who are going to go out and to preach. And it's as we read in the book of Acts, even, even as the, the gospel is spread by every one of us. It's the one who has the gospel in his or her heart who then seeks to spread that gospel. The sower then sows the word, he says. And it's an interesting illustration because all throughout the New Testament, read that the, the word of God is likened to seeds. 
that we have been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, absolutely. But the imagery of that in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, James 1, for example, is see that God's gospel has come into our hearts like good soil prepared by the Holy Spirit and has landed there and has given life to us. We've been born again through the seed of the word. The sower sows the word, Jesus says. And these, verse 15 and following, these are the ones along the path and so forth. So what are the various soils upon which this word, this seed, falls upon? Notice he describes there, back to those four soils, the one that falls upon the path, the walkway, the sidewalk, as it were. When, when the gospel goes forth and it's like a seed of grass that falls upon your sidewalk and the birds come and devour it instantaneously when they see that seed hit that sidewalk or that pathway, this is the one who hears with his outward or her outward ears the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet the devil, Satan, immediately comes and takes away the word that's sown in them. This is the one who comes, who just comes here because they have to come here. This is the one who comes here because they've been dragged here. They, they just merely came here because they're on their way. Maybe that's you today. You've come here because you're on your way to something else. And you just got to go or you got to be there. Someone invited you on, on your way to a party or something. You're here along the sidewalk. You're on the path. But you're not in. And you hear the word. It's like seed. It falls upon your heart. You hear it does nothing. The devil plucks it up and takes it for himself. Then there's a rocky soil, he says. Again, a, the illustration was of, 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 of a thin layer of soil, and below that, the rocks, the, the bedrock, the limestone, and so forth of the, of the ancient world. The word, the seed, hits this heart Immediately, notice, because there is a small layer of soil, immediately there's joy. The person who's interested in theological things or religious things or spiritual things, there's a small layer there. They seem to us to be open to the gospel and they hear from us the word and they immediately spring up with joy, we are told, but there's no root. And because there's no root, maybe Jesus or maybe... maybe uh, uh, We've seen this many times I mean, in 20 years. Many people get interested about Reformed theology and they get really excited in their brains about theological debate and so forth. There's no depth of soil for many of these people. It's not a little, it's not a little puzzle game that we're playing to fit all these little parts into, into the right place and to, just to do that. And some people think that when they've done that, they've sort of done the paint by numbers, they finish the page that they're done and there's no, there's no depth there. And what happens, notice, the tribulations, the persecutions come on account of the word and they fall away. And it's been all, this way all throughout the history of the Christian church. When people find out what Christians believe, you believe, what? The persecution hits, the, the tribulation comes. This is not just something for our age when we have to face up to all kinds of pressures by our society. No, Christians have survived. Keep calm, remember? Kingdom on. There are, so, there are, there are, there are, there are soils, there are hearts, there are people that the seed comes to, the word comes to, but they're like thorns and, and they're like weeds that are within their hearts. All the cares of the world, right? So many things to do. The deceitfulness of riches, so much money to make. The desires for other things. Choke, right? Choke out that seed that begins to germinate, and sprout just a little bit, but chokes it all out, devours it for itself. So there are soils like the path and the rocky soil, the thorn the soil with thorns and thistles and weeds, crabgrass and so forth. These are, the, these are the kinds of people that we saw many uh, moons ago back in the, the book of Hebrews chapter 6. These are those that that, uh, that, that apostolic-inspired author described when he 
spoke about many who have come to hear the gospel. In Hebrews 6, for example, we read this, that it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and have tasted the power of the age to come. But yet they fall away. It's impossible to restore them, he says, to repentance. There are many people who come into contact with us as Christians and us as a body of Christians, as a congregation, and who taste the power of heaven, who hear the goodness of the word of God, whose eyes are somewhat enlightened, whose hearts are somewhat of a couple of inches of soil, and the word began to do something, but yet it is meaningless. But there's one kind of soil, Jesus says. There's one kind of soil, though, one kind of a here that we want to be. We don't want to be those who are like the seed falling on a sidewalk. The bird, Satan, takes it away. We don't want to be like those who hear the word like rocky soil and it springs up but it burns away because of persecution. We don't want to be like those that are seeds that begin to come to life but yet thorns and weeds choke it up and eat it up, although cares of the world and so forth. And there is good soil though. That's the kind of seed we want to be, the kind of heart we want to have, the soil that we want to have within us, the good soil notice but those that were sown verse 20 on the good soil are the ones who hear the word notice and accept it who hear the word and accept it notice that that's that little that little accepted is added here isn't it All the others hear the words. Only this kind accepts it. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? They hear it, they accept it, and it bears fruit, notice, right? It's productive. 30 times over sometimes, 60 times over sometimes, 100 times over. Productive. I mean, can we imagine planting one seed and having a hundred times what we've planted? I planted this ice cream banana, it's called, a blue java banana tree in my backyard last year. My kids know this. I have yet to eat one banana. They told me that this is the tastiest banana in the world. They called the ice cream banana because it tastes like vanilla ice cream, I was told. I love vanilla ice cream. I like bananas, but I like vanilla ice cream more. I've yet, as I planted that, I've yet, as I fertilized it, I have, I've trimmed it, I've tried to help it, I've yet to eat even one vanilla bean tasting ice cream, a uh, banana, yet, right? My kids are waiting. Where is the ice cream banana? Enough of the chiquitas. Where's the ice cream banana, Right? But a hundredfold, sixtyfold, even just, just thirtyfold, if I can just get that. We want to be the ones who hear and are accepting and who bear fruit. This is the kingdom of God, then. This is the kingdom of God to us. Just in, in closing, a couple of things to mention about this really, really quick. Again, all this, this parable, and as the kingdom of God is like a sower who sows seed upon various soils, Three of the soils don't respond, ultimately, positively. Only one does, but it does so uh, disproportionately to its only being one kind of soil. All of this presupposes that everyone's heart is hard in soil. It must be granted to us by God's grace. It must be granted to the human heart by the grace of God to not just hear, but to accept, and not just to accept, but to be fruitful. It's a power of grace. That's why we can be calm. We can be calm as citizens of God's kingdom and continue in our our task as members of his kingdom. We can be calm because we know that it's the power of God that ultimately gives life. Secondly, as just a quick point, 
At the same time, when Jesus says it's granted to just some, and not those outside, at the same time, how does the sower spread his seed? Does the sower do a soil test first in this parable? Does the, so- does the sower uh, uh, bring over Ed Whitehouse, right? And teach me how to do soil in my backyard? No. Okay. No. He does what with the seed? He scatters it. He spreads it indiscriminately. The gospel proclamation, not just from me, but from all of us as we share the gospel, it cannot have discrimination. We spread this seed. We tell everyone that we possibly can, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, the gospel. And so on the one hand, it's, we, we, we have a parable that presupposes that everyone's heart is hardened. On the other hand, we are to share this gospel with everyone upon every kind of soul, no matter how hard it is, indiscriminately, without discrimination. Thirdly, just quickly, again, just to reiterate this, only some receive and are fruitful. Only some receive and are fruitful. There's no, there, there's, there's, there's no magical, there's no guaranteed, uh, there's no perfect program, there's no perfect uh, 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 tried and true way to bring sinners to know Jesus other than sharing the gospel. I get emails daily. They see our website, they find my, my email. I get emails daily saying, if you would follow this plan, if you would invite us to your church, if you would bring, if you would read this book, if you would listen to the CD set, if you would watch these YouTube videos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you would just dot, 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 then. And you know what the punchline is, right? Then you would have success beyond your wildest imagination. Only some receive. That's the way of the kingdom. Only some receive and are fruitful. And the most important thing of all is this. I've already said it, just to reiterate it. What's this, what's the, the whole parable is about what? It's about God's kingdom. All these things, the, everyone's hearts are hard. The seed must be sown to everyone, though, at the same time. Yet, knowing that only some are going to receive it and be fruitful, all these things are reconciled. They're all figured out. They're all solved. This conundrum and so forth, it all finds its answer in, in God, who's the king of the kingdom, who says, in the very words of Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe. These things are reconciled in God alone. And so here is a secret of the kingdom. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone must hear the gospel. Only some are going to receive it. Let God do his work. Let God do his work. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, where he says, uh, uh, I preached, Apollos watered, but who gave the growth? God gave the growth. One plants, one cultivates, it's God who gives the growth. What kind of here are you this morning? What kind do you want to be? What kind do you desire to be? Hear. Hear the Lord. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Give yourself to the King, Jesus. Come into his kingdom. Be sent out by him into the world to spread the seed with confidence that it's God who gives the growth. Let's pray.